Good evening. I'm excited to welcome everyone watching tonight safely distanced across Nebraska and around the world. My name is Ronnie Green and I have the privilege of serving as the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Thank you for turning your attention to Nebraska's Home for the Arts here at the Lead Center for the Performing Arts on the campus of UNL and tonight's opening of the Mosaic Film Festival featuring two films produced by UNL's own alumna, Ingrid Holmquist. We are so proud and pleased that the Lead Center has been able to creatively continue connecting Nebraskans and people around the world to the arts during these challenging times. We are very pleased and excited to be co-hosting tonight in partnership with the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs, this special showing of the documentary film, Chief Standing Bear, a journey to Statuary Hall, a story over a century in the making and quite relevant to our nation today. And I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion following from the leaders who made this historic journey happen and have so beautifully told the story you will have the opportunity to see up close and personal tonight. Thank you once again for your interest tonight and for your continuing support of the LEAD Center. Before we begin the film, I take great pleasure in introducing the chairman of the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska. He is also the area vice president for the National Congress on American Indians, the Great Plains region, and a commissioner on the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs, in addition to being an accomplished educator, businessman, and father. Without further ado, please welcome Ponca chairman, Mr. Larry Wright, Jr., for a blessing and land acknowledgement to start our evening. It's an honor to, to be asked to be here tonight to, and, and do the invocation and land acknowledgement. And on behalf of the Ponca Nation, I want to recognize the other three federally recognized headquartered tribes in Nebraska, the Santee Sioux Nation, the Winnebago Nation, and the Omaha Nation. And I also want to recognize uh, all of Nebraska before we had these geopolitical borders. 26 indigenous tribes called this state home uh, long before any, anyone else was here. And, and we lived here uh, together. And, and I want to acknowledge all of those nations that uh, wherever they are at today, that this will always be their homeland. And with that, I'd like to say this invocation. I ask that you uh, uh, forgive me. Uh, speak in front of my my elders, uh, wherever they may be watching today, uh, and please uh, bow your heads and, and pray uh, in your way. Oh, Wakanda, they na the hanudani, omba de wadaik de eshti wiblehon shidade, shidego wongi de agati ikte wiblehon shidade, pongkungadi bluga da onwa gida ga, nyonshinga ukedi. Ongi de ekitaha, walombaga. Nyonshinga, one no she hidi, HD, daeda de comblega. Great spirit, we thank you for this day. We thank you <clears throat> for allowing each of us to be here. It's good to pray to you. I ask that you watch over all of our Ponca people, all the tribal nations, our veterans, and all of those that come here today uh, as we work together to celebrate. Uh, this accomplishment and all of those who work so hard to make this happen uh, through their hard work, their creative vision, and all of those that help share this story for this generation and the next. We ask that uh, you watch over all of those people that are suffering because of this COVID uh, disease, all of those that have lost their lives, their families who are struggling, those that uh, have this uh, uh, disease now, Help us uh, be strong with each other and for each other. And thank you for all these things. Ede Wongi Day, all my relations. Thank you. It's about time. It's about time that uh, 
you know, we're being uh, looked at. Now we are a people of this country. Standing Bear is widely regarded as the Martin Luther King of Native America, as its first civil rights champion. There's so many people that don't know the story of Chief Standing Bear. He was the one who actually gave the ability for Native Americans to be in a completely different status. The United States government and, and people in general knew nothing about Indians other than warfare. They weren't used to Indians being in a courtroom. Statuary Hall is an important place in the capital and in the history of America. Statuary Hall used to be the chamber where the House of Representatives conducted its business. Justin Morrill, who was a representative at the time, a congressman, he's the one who really was able to propose the legislation for the creation of the National Statuary Hall, and that finally happened in 1864. The real point of having a National Statuary Hall isn't just to celebrate individuals that we all know and already celebrate. It's to pick those unsung heroes from your state that really are deserving of a national stage but haven't maybe had their story told around the country. Statues in the capital of the United States are there largely at the wish of the state legislatures. Each state gets two statues. The only rules that the federal government enacted as part of this legislation is that the person needed to be notable, they had to be deceased, the rest was really a sort of a state decision. Of course, all bills start as an idea, and uh, the original idea was that we would like to have uh, written a bill to have Standing Bear exchange for one of the two statues there. 807 was the original bill that was uh, going to replace uh, J. Sterling Morton with Willa Cather. William Jennings Bryan was the first statue along with Julius Sterling Morton that Nebraska chose to place in the Statuary Hall collection. William Jennings Bryan had ran for president, I believe, three times, never won, and had also been the editor for the Omaha World Herald and the Secretary of State. So it's not to take away from his contributions to Nebraska or to this country. The reason why these replacement opportunities for states came about through federal legislation was that so states could honor more than just one or two people. Anyone who would ever come to the Capitol would see that it was dominated by white males, which is okay for what the purpose of, the, of what they contributed, but that shouldn't be to the exclusion of women and people of color who've been so much a part of our country. Throughout the history with our relationship to the federal government that so we've always been looked at, on the border of a citizen, but also mainly looked at as an alien. Many of our, our people, they fought and gave their lives for us to be here, to be recognized, to, to be able to live today. Our homeland was in Niagara, Nebraska. I've got you know, grandmother, great-grandmothers that are buried in that cemetery. And it's just a place where you can really connect and feel like you're at home there. You know, just kind of like when you come in your own home, you know, where you kind of just ah, relax. You're at home. You can hear the tall grasses kind of shuffle as the wind passes through them. So this land's everything for us. I mean, it's where all of our ancestors are buried for centuries. You know, the bones of our relatives, our ancestors, go back into the earth. All the grass, the animals, the vegetation, all those things that grow after our people were buried. Our DNA is in all those things. You can't take us from the land because that's part of us. To be taken away from our ancestors was something that's hard to imagine and unfathomable. And it really you know, came about through an, an error, I would say. The United States government, through the Treaty of Fort Laramie in, in 1868, 
really accidentally provided our land to the Lakota Nation. The government didn't want to correct that mistake, so unfortunately they decided to force us from our homelands, move us to Oklahoma. Standing Bear and some other Ponca tribal chiefs said, no, this is not where we want to be. I said, you know what? It doesn't matter what you think. You're going anyways. They got a um, issued of the army to escort us. And that was the Ponca Trail of Tears of 1875. We walked over 500 miles down to Oklahoma and many of our tribal members passed away along the journey. And when they got down there, nothing for our people to live on. A lot of people started dying down there because it's a whole different environment. They moved us to Oklahoma and wanted us to do all the things that we were already doing up there but didn't survive. From summer of 1877 to summer of 1878, one third of the Ponca tribe died of malaria. Chief Standing Bear had no idea uh, what to do. There was nothing to prevent his people from dying. Christmas week of 1878, his only son, a 14-year-old boy named Bear Shield, lay dying on the bottom of a dank army canvas tent, curled up in a fetal position, slowly dying of malaria. And before his eyes closed in death, he begged his father, he begged Chief Standing Bear, take me home so I can be with, be with our people in the lands that were dreamed to us. So we said, okay. I mean, if you imagine that sitting there, your child saying that to you, you, know, you, you have an obligation to honor your child, right? So that's what he was doing. So they didn't get permission to, to kind of, they said, like, we're going. Chief Standing Bear, then in his late 50s, he wrapped the body of his only son, Bear Shield, in his best clothes, and then wrapped his body in a buffalo robe and gently put it into the back of a rickety buckboard wagon. And about one o'clock that afternoon, he and 29 others were going to fulfill a promise that the chief had made to his son. And at that moment in history, January 2nd, 1879, the government of the United States had entered into 374 treaties with the native people of America. And on January 2nd, 1879, by then they had broken all 374 treaties. But Standing Bear was not going to break the promise that he had made his son. You know, you lost people coming down, being removed from Nebraska to Oklahoma, and you knew that you're probably gonna lose somebody going home. For them to risk that, and you know, we're here because of that. He knew he ran the risk of possibly getting caught by the federal government, uh, and that happened when he got into Omaha. I think it was more shocking for our Omaha relatives to see the condition that they were in, some barefoot, bleeding, starving and word got out to Fort Omaha, not far away, that a group of renegade uh, Ponca men, women, and children had abandoned the reservation without permission, and they needed to be rounded up, and they were. Brigadier General George Crook, who had spent the last 15, 20 years fighting Native American tribes, stood on the steps of the general's quarters at Fort Omaha on that late March morning in 1879, and he watched these 30 men, women, and Ponca children. And it really struck him hard what he saw. I felt sympathy, but he was, I still gotta follow through with my words. There was this guy named Thomas Tibbles mm. who had been known to be like friendly to the Indian. He was a uh, journalist and he caught wind of it. Tibbles shed light on that situation. And I, you know, without General Crooks and Tibbles, you know, it never would have happened. You know, if it was any other general, you know, any other people, our story may not have been told. May of 1879, we have a middle-aged American Indian chief walking into a court of law, suing the powerful government of the United States on the belief that they had no legal right to keep him in prison, that they had no legal right to keep him from burying his son. The argument against him was Indianism. 
considered a citizen or, or a person under United States law. The renegade, the hostile, that sort of thing. And they filed a writ of habeas corpus, which is a fancy legal word, which essentially means the government has to prove that they have a legal right to detain, in this case, Standing Bear. The substance of this trial was, is this even allowable? Does the Standing Bear or Indians even have standing to be in a courtroom to file a lawsuit? General Crooks, young, brash, inexperienced lawyer argued that this should never have gone to trial because you had to be a citizen in order to file a writ of habeas corpus claim, General Crook's attorney. But Standing Bear's attorney pointed out that that wasn't the case. You had to be a citizen or a person. So the only question now before the judge was whether or not Standing Bear was a person. So the case goes from May 1st, all of May 2nd, everybody has had their say. At the last minute, as evening falls, on May 2nd, 1879, this jam courthouse looks on in astonishment as they see this middle-aged Native American chief get up from the plaintiff's table, walk to the judge's bench, look up, extend his right hand, holding it there for a long time. Since that hand is not the color of yours, if I prick it, the blood will flow and I shall feel pain. The blood is the same color as yours. God made me, I am man. I never committed any crime. If I had, I would not stand here to make a defense. I would suffer the punishment and make no complaint. I seem to be standing on a high bank of a great river with my wife and little girl at my side. I cannot cross that river and impassable cliffs arise behind me. I hear the noise of great waters. I look and see a flood coming. The waters rise to our feet and then to our knees. My little girl stretches her hands towards me and says, save me. I stand where no member of my race ever stood before. There's no tradition to guide me. The chiefs who preceded me knew nothing of the circumstances that surround me. I hear only my little girl say, save me. In despair, I look toward the cliffs behind me and I see a dim trail that may lead to a way of life. But no Indian ever passed over that trail. It looks to be impassable. I make the attempt. I take my child by the hand. My wife follows after me. Our hands, our feet are torn by the sharp rocks, and our trail is marked by our blood. At last I see a rift in the rocks. A little way beyond, there are green prairies. The swift running water, the Niobrara, pours between the green hills. There are the graves of my fathers. There again, we will pitch our teepee and build our fires. I see the light of the world and of liberty just ahead. But in the center of the path, there stands a man. Behind him, I see soldiers in number like the leaves of the trees. If that man gives me the permission, I may pass onto life and liberty. If he refuses, I must go back and sink beneath the flood. You are that man. And as the trial and Standing Bear's words echoed, women could be heard weeping in the back. Before long, General Crook got up from his defense table and went over and shook Standing Bear's hand. Then there was applause. It's indigenous people are, are the embodiment of these words, right? Because it stood for Indian people. That's why it's so important, because it stood for Indian people. We're relatives. Why can't you see what I'm trying to do is something in, in honor, right? You know, for my son. Wouldn't you do the same? Even though the judge made this monumental, incredible civil rights case where he said Indians are human beings within the meaning of the law, we had nowhere to go to. They had taken our homelands away in Nebraska. And so that wasn't the end of the story. Standing Bear still had to go make further efforts 
and plead for the government to give us back some land so that he could stay up in Nebraska where our traditional homelands were. And finally, the government returned some land to the Ponca and we were able to return to Niobrara and he was able to grant his son his dying wish. One of the things we did was we walked through the trial and the decision of Judge Dundee on the floor of the legislature. We actually read portions of it. That this hand is not the color of yours, but if I pierce it, it will have pain. It was right after we read that that then we took a vote. Those in favor vote aye, those opposed vote nay. And once we shared the story of Sanding Bear with the legislature, it was an easy sell. Uh, there was no opposition whatsoever. Walk through, watch your step here. Well, the journey began uh, when I met Judy Gashkabas, and uh, she told me the story as she tells it to anybody who will listen. I probably said, you know, we ought to think about doing a statue. And they just asked, would I be interested in taking a commission to create a sculpture of Chief Standing Bear? This is the Quay original of Standing Bear. He's all beat up from the mold making. You can see all of the seams where each mold was made. We have to do it in sections on a full-size sculpture like this. They try to study get into the idea and the concept behind what I'm representing so that when you see the final piece, it has that spirit behind it of representation of a greater concept. Nowhere is that more true than the Standing Bear sculpture, of course. And I, I began to create and design from that point. It has to start with the statue that was put in uh, Lincoln, because that's where the statue was, uh, was developed for. So they contacted me about creating this sculpture for Lincoln, Nebraska, right near their state capital. And they created a space to the indigenous peoples of Nebraska. There's a feature wall in this plaza, and then there's the centerpiece of the sculpture of Chief Standing Bear. During the process of creating the sculpture for Lincoln, um, I met Larry Wright, the chairman of the Ponca tribe. So as we're here today to honor our Nudahonga, Altunazay, she's standing bare. And Larry said, well, would you be able to create one for the tribal lands? The second statue on the uh, Ponca lands up in Niobrara, and the third in the, in the United States uh, Statuary Hall. And so that's kind of how this organically became three statues where it started only as one. When the clay is all finished and detailed, we make molds of the entire piece, and they took the molds from there and poured the waxes and then did each step. So in the lost wax process, the waxes are poured and then they're sprued and dipped in ceramic shell. And that shell coats the waxes inside and out. And then it's passed through a high temperature oven where the wax is melted out. And that negative space in the ceramic shell is where the molten bronze is poured. And when it's poured and it's cooled, the ceramic shells are cracked off of the bronze and those raw bronze castings are cleaned up, welded together, and then the welds have to all be chased off so that you can't see where any of the welds were. And once that was all finished, we bead blasted the sculpture and then did the patina. Patina is a chemical coloration that's applied to the metal. And so the metal's heated and then different chemicals are applied with water. And then as those chemicals bond to the surface of the metal, it actually oxidizes it to different colorations. And getting the bronze finished and then creating up the bronze was also a process, you know, getting it all the way to DC. It's like hard to describe the feeling of the sculpture arriving and meeting me there in front of the Capitol. The level of excitement, it's like being in a championship game right before the game. You can't wait to get out there on the floor. Times that by about a thousand. Part of my role is guiding the design process. And then the other part of my role is being here when the statues arrive, which generally happens in the dead of night. <laughs> it's a little different than going to a gallery and hanging paintings on a wall. They had to have an enormous crane that lifted the box up and 
passed it through the front doors there of the Capitol. You're just hoping, I mean, praying, hoping everything will go well. You're so powerless in that situation, you know, it feels like they're handling your baby. It takes several, several hours to position a sculpture. And then, of course, the other sculpture that was here prior was also was removed. We had to get William Jennings Bryan out, who was going back to Nebraska. They brought him out first, and then they moved uh, Mr. Russell over to where Brian was, and then they moved Mr. Burke over to where Mr. Russell had been, and then that opened up the space for Chief Standing Bear to go where Mr. Burke had been. He came in laying backwards with his arm up like this, and they had to tip the box all the way up. We actually got to stand back and just look, and they're cleaning up their stuff. In that moment, it just took my breath away. And he started coming out, and he had his hand out. I felt like he was looking at me. And that was the moment for me where I felt like he is here in the United States Capitol and that so many people will get to witness that and see him. My children, my sons, will be able to see a Ponca person in the United States Capitol and that we are still here. I just think about those times when our grandfathers and grandmothers came here, you know, to, to, to meet and to speak and to negotiate peace, to still carry on that, you know, that dream and that, that vision of what they wanted, you know. It's emotional, you know, being here. Have you seen the finished product? No, I haven't. The statue? Uh-uh. Every morning I braid my hair, right? What I was taught by braiding my hair is remembering. Remembering who you are. The braid itself represents love, represents mind, body, spirit. And then the, the values, strength, humility, and compassion. So when I braid, I, I remember. I remember standing there. I remember the history of the people. I remember, uh, I remember teachings. I remember stories. You guys got a heater around here? You thought no? <laughs> I feel like I'm supposed to be here. Yeah. It's good that uh, the United States is, is honoring you know, one of ours. I just ask that people uh, kind of live how, what he talked about, you know? And I think about a lot of Indian leaders, you know? That's what kind of sits with me right now. <laughs> so I, that's why I said I feel like I'm supposed to be here. Please rise for the presentation of the colors of the United States and the Ponca tribe, the singing of our national anthem, and the retiring of the colors. If we're going to improve the future, we must acknowledge the past. Chief Standing Bear faced injustices beyond imagination. The injustice of being forced from his ancestral homeland, the injustice of losing hundreds of members of his tribal family, including his son, Bear Shield, to starvation and suffering because the U.S. government's broken treaty promises. It is almost unthinkable to us today that it wasn't until 1879, after Standing Bear's trial, that Native Americans were declared to be persons for consideration of the law. The House of Representatives met in this room. 
that we are now in until 1857. And their deliberations were watched over by another statue, Cleo, the muse of history. She served as a constant reminder that their words and actions, the good and the bad, would be judged by time. Cleo was here watching, recording, when in 1830, Congress shamefully passed the Indian Removal Act in this very room. Amazing journey that Standing Bear had been on. A journey that began in May of 1877 that included 550 miles of being forcibly marched across Nebraska, across Kansas, into Oklahoma, to think of the march back on January 2nd, 1879, and still the journey is not complete. And then it goes to a courtroom, and then he gets a verdict, and the journey continues to the sacred white bluffs overlooking the Niobara. And you would think, okay, well, that's a really powerful end to the Standing Bear story, but it doesn't end there. And so after all of this walking, and after all of this heartbreak, and after all of this effort and fight, to bury his son. And in the, in the course of burying his son, he becomes a civil rights icon for his people and he creates new law. The journey finally ends in September of 2019 when he walks into Statuary Hall in the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. Good evening. My name is Patrice McMahon, and I'm a professor of political science at the University of Nebraska. And I have the distinct honor and pleasure of facilitating tonight's panel discussion. It is certainly the right time, despite COVID-19, to celebrate Chief Standing Bear's journey to Statuary Hall and to recognize the rich history of Native Americans and the leadership of Chief Standing Bear. I would like to introduce our panelists, and then we'll talk more about Chief Standing Bear, the journey to Statuary Hall, and the importance of these events to us today. From left to right on the stage, first we have Larry Wright Jr., who is the current chairman and a citizen of the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska. He is also the area vice president for the National Congress of American Indians for the Great Plains region, and he currently serves as the chair of the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs. Wright is an infantry veteran with service in the United States Army National Guard. He earned his bachelor's degree in social science from the University of Nebraska at Kearney 
and his master's degree in historical studies from Nebraska Wesleyan University. Our second panelist is Judy Goshkibos, who has served as the executive director of the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs since 1995. She is an enrolled member of the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska. Judy earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Human Relations in 2000 from Doan University, and in 2007, she earned a Master's degree in Management with a leadership emphasis from Doan University. She is currently a, tr a Doan University trustee. Right in the middle, we have Ben Victor, who is an artist from Boise, Idaho. At the age of 26, he became the youngest artist ever to have a sculpture in our nation's foremost collection, the National Statuary Hall in the United States Capitol. In 2019, he became the only living artist to have three works in the Statuary Hall with the dedication of his Ponca Chief Standing Bear piece in 2019. Our fourth panelist is Ingrid Holmquist. She is a documentary filmmaker from Nebraska, currently based in New York City. She has worked on films for CNN, HBO, The New Yorker, and others. She is a proud UNL alum and focused on using her filmmaking skills to collaborate and elevate the stories of others. Our final panelist is Don Campbell, who is the founder and senior advisor to the company Partners for Growth. He holds a Bachelor's of Science degree from the University of Nebraska and a Master's in Business Administration from Stanford University. He currently serves on the Board of Trustees of Doan University. He is a donor for both the Standing Bear Sculpture on Lincoln Centennial Mall and the recently dedicated piece in Statuary Hall. So let's talk. This is a reunion for you all. I don't know when the last time you were together. Were you ever together in one place in Washington? Was that the last time? All right. Well, this is exciting. Larry, if you don't mind starting us off as the current chairman of the Ponca tribe, I, can you tell us a little bit more about Chief Standing Bear and his significance? Well, I, I don't know how to add to what the, the, the great video we just saw uh, said, but you know, I, I think first and foremost for, for our Ponca people, uh, the, the significance, and even, even before that, the, the story of, of, of him as a father making that commitment to his son uh, to, to bring him home, uh, the only home his son knew, the only home Standing Bear knew, uh, to be buried with our, with our relatives, our ancestors. Uh, that, that alone stands by itself, but I think the significance of, of Standing Bear and what he did is, is, shows today. We are here today in Nebraska as Ponca people because of, of what he did. And, and that will resonate uh, from the time that he did that to this generation and future generations uh, because this is where we're from and this is where we call home. And we wouldn't be here if him and those that followed him uh, didn't take that uh, extraordinary uh, step uh, to come home and put themselves in harm's way, not knowing uh, what they were going to face, if they'd even make it, uh, but they were going to try. And, and we, uh, we are definitely the beneficiaries of that sacrifice today. Could you say a little bit more about the for having the formal recognition in the capital, what it's meant to you personally and to the Ponca, Ponca tribe? <clears throat> um, you know, I think personally, you know, even, even today, uh, I came, I was in Niobrara to this morning, yesterday, last night, late last night, today, and, and seeing the statue there before I left, uh, knowing I was going to be here tonight, and, and knowing that um, his statue overlooks our homeland, overlooks his gravesite, uh, overlooks the Niobrara River, and 1,300 miles to the east, is a statue uh, in the nation's capital. Not, not as many people will see it in our homeland, but we know that that's where it originates. 
but millions will see that statue in Statuary Hall. Millions of people who never heard of Standing Bear, never heard of the Ponca people, will hear our story and what our people went through. And, and just, again, as, as the video showed, everything that went into it, I, I, I don't even, not to, it doesn't do it all justice watching Ben make that and have an opportunity to see him do that. You know, the beads on the moccasins were each one individually rolled. And, and knowing that and, and seeing where it is and seeing that story uh, for all of those that are here today, but, you know, our next generation, it's, uh, you know, my, my kids haven't seen it yet. They've seen it in video. They've seen the pictures. They haven't had a chance to go there yet. Uh, and I want to be there when they do. And, and that's a story, uh, as Katie talked about, with her young boys, when they become old enough to un really appreciate that, understand what that is, and, be, and the fact that they were part of that. But, but knowing from, from my generation, and I've said this story before, when our Ponca people were terminated uh, in the 60s, you know, my father, my aunts, uncles, grandparents, relatives, all Ponca's in that generation, and those that were alive at that time, they went from being Ponca and being Indian to being told, you don't exist. And when I was born, the Ponca tribe didn't exist. And when my children were born, the Ponca tribe was here again because of the work and, and the sacrifices and the, and the struggles and the fights that those, uh, our leaders at that time wanted to bring our people back. And so um, through all of those generations of fights and, and termination, relocation, uh, and, and the constant battles our people fought to see that statue in the Capitol brings it all home and, and it'll be there for as long. Uh, I hope it's there longer than what the last statues were. Uh, because when you see that statue in that hall amongst all the rest, it stands out without a doubt. And it's a, it's, it draws everybody to that story. And, and that story resonates, I believe, with anybody from any nationality um, because of what it was and what it continues to be. Thank you for that. That's great. Judy, congratulations. I know this has been maybe not your life's work, but it's been so important to your professional and personal life. To what extent do you think this it represents a real significant change in, in the United States, or how do you see this? Patrice, thank you so much. Uh, and I want to thank everybody on the panel and the audience. I hope that you were as moved as I was to see that and here at the lead we got to see it on the big screen so although I was involved in the behind the scenes Ingrid did such a fabulous job and uh, of course Don Miller Campbell uh, without Don that wouldn't have happened and thankfully I met Don nine years ago when I became a Doan trustee and Don was moved by uh, learning about what Larry Chairman Wright just shared our story of the Ponca people and this great man. And so then we found Ben Victor, this magical person. And I think when I started 25 years ago as the director of the Indian Commission, oh wow, I never dreamed that this would happen. <laughs> they had just put the mural up on the 14th floor done by Steve Roberts and I assisted with that. And I started, uh, thinking and dreaming about Chief Standing Bear. And little by little, uh, we built up uh, a lot of history and educated a lot of people. So that finally, it seemed as though the stars were aligned and we had the state's attention and it was time to do something good for Indian people. We had our first state senator, senator uh, Native American senator, Tom Brewer, who isn't with us tonight, but Senator Brewer, thank you so much. And he used to be on our Indian Commission. So we worked with him, and because of Senator Brewer 
and his magical touch with our unicameral majority Republican, he was able to get everybody to come together so that we could have that. And I think uh, what was happening in America, finally, this was a unifying story that brought us together. As you saw out there at the dedication, there were people from both sides of the aisle. And almost anyone that hears this story of Standing Bear can't help but feel the love of uh, your child, making a promise, keeping your word. And so I say to all of the children watching, especially the tribal children, uh, we are here, we were here, we will be here forever. And this is a reminder of that. And I hope many of you will get to go to the Capitol in Washington, D.C. and see Standing Bear. But if you don't, you can come here to Centennial Mall, or you can go to the Ponca Homelands and learn about Ponca Chief Standing Bear. And dreams can come true and do come true in America. And we do have good people like Don Miller Campbell and uh, brilliant filmmakers like Ingrid, who went away to Columbia and came back. And it's just been a oh pleasure. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed working with her. And Ben, well, Ben has three sculptures in Statuary Hall. Not only was he the youngest person, but he has the most. And from the very beginning, he was so inspired by the story and learned so much about it. And he listened to us as he developed that and designed. And so again, I say uh, it's a magical time. And even though right now, as Indian people often are invisible, we in America are in fighting an invisible enemy, the COVID. But we will prevail, just like Standing Bear and the Ponca people did. And through that, uh, what we've done here, we're all going to get better and stronger. So, Patrice, that's, that's what I think, and that's what it means. And I think, uh, am I surprised it happened? Sometimes I am. <laughs> Sometimes I'm surprised. I wake up and can't even believe it. I'm so lucky. I'm so blessed by uh, my, what I do for our people and by my family, uh, my children and my grandchildren. This is just a really a gift that keeps on giving and it's a legacy that I'm honored to have played a little part in. We are all very grateful for your hard work. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about making this statue. Ben, I, I, I'm not a sculptor, I'm not an artist. What, what's the process? Somebody gives you an idea or makes a request and then what happens? What, what? You know, it's different for every project, even though the technical part of the process is really um, outlined very well in that wonderful documentary. Um, there's a real creative process that goes into it. And with the Standing Bear sculpture, one thing that stands out in my mind was that I had the opportunity, and I'm humbled to have the opportunity, to listen to the Native people about their history and their story with Chief Standing Bear. And that was one of the most important parts, was to get to really spend time on the Ponca homeland and walk where Standing Bear walked, and then hear the stories from Larry and Dwight and others in the tribe, and Judy, of course, who, who was the driving force behind the whole project. And then, you know, in, in that wonderful film, to, to get to see the actual dedication again and think about how descendants like Steve Larravee and his son were there at the dedication and their words just bring me to tears every time I watch that and I hear them talk about it and Katie to hear her say that now her little children will get to see a Native American, a great American and a, a great hero of humanity in the National Statuary Hall. That's all, that's what moves me. And so that's why this process was a little bit different and a little bit unique and wonderful because of it. And you have three statues. Was, was making this one more, more challenging in some ways or easier because of the story? It was very challenging. You know, you've got everything from the bear claw necklace, the intricate uh, detail that Larry alluded to on the the moccasins and on his blanket, all the beautiful beadwork. There's a lot of intricate detail and then it's a large sculpture too. So there was a great challenge and there was extra effort and heart put into it every step of the way. Um, when we got to the foundry, I think everybody probably noticed at that unveiling, 
the amount of polish work that was put into that bronze to bring out the patina and the different tints and tones on the actual sculpture. So, you know, all of these things were the type of challenges that, that just bring out the best in you as an artist, you know, to get to do this type of sculpture and to have that meaning behind it and then just the good energy all the way around. Like Judy said, it, this is one of the few times when you go to Washington, D.C. anymore and you see both sides of the aisle, every walk of life, cheering this project on and cheering on the legacy of Chief Standing Bear. So it was really special. Well, congratulations to you. Ingrid, you're from Nebraska, so maybe this story was familiar to you. What did you know before you were asked to make this film? And what process did you go through once you were starting to make the film? Yeah, um, I did know who Chief Standing Bear was before, prior because my mom's a bit of a Nebraska history buff. Um, and then I learned even more, but that wasn't a, a ton of information. I learned even more in college when I had Joe Starita for a professor. Um, but it wasn't until be, being called on by Judy to, to tackle this project that I learned all of the, detail, all of the details and all of the, the intricacy of the story and everything that Chief Standing Bear had to go through, all of the, all of the nuance that wasn't able to be even captured in this half hour documentary. So yeah, the stage of research is kind of similar to Ben's actually. Um, I started reading, I started watching Standing Bear's footsteps. Um, I, and, but I think the key most important piece of research that I did, similar to Ben, was having, my inter having interviews, speaking to people, hearing the story recounted over and over and over, and learning something new each time, and learning not only just the, the details of the story, what happened and when and where, but the emotions of the story as well, and the, the significance to people is, is part of it too. And so speaking to so many Ponca people and so many direct descendants of Chief Standing Bear and allowing them the space to share the story of their lives and of, of Chief Standing Bear and what it means to have a statue um, a Ponca, of a Ponca person, of a Ponca chief, of a civil rights leader of his time. Uh, that was my greatest, greatest education. And of course, through Judy. So you said that one of your goals is to elevate the stories of others. What do you think that this movie kind of tells the world or shouts out to the world about Chief Standing Bear, Ponca, Native Americans, or indigenous peoples? Yeah, I mean, I think it says a lot. Judy and I talk a lot in our creation of this film about just everything that this moment means. And it's, it's about, of course, elevating the story of Chief Standing Bear and of the Ponca tribe and education, of course, which is something Judy and I care a lot about for the future of this film. And, you know, allowing more people to understand who he was, what he stood for, um, and also the history of native people. Um, more than that, it's also about the statue element that adds in this extra interesting layer that can really make you think about the subjects of this, the subject matter of this film for a really long time because, you know, it's on top of a biography, it's a story about who we decide to elevate and who we decide to put on a literal pedestal and who we decide to encase in bronze and gold and then put in, as Ben told me once, the pantheon of heroes. This is the pantheon of heroes, is the statuary hall. So then to, to who it is we choose is so important. And while I was working on this film, I was, I was working on it outside of my day job. And I was working at Columbus Circle. And, oh, thank you. Um, I was working at Columbus Circle. And every time I left, my work, I would see the Christopher Columbus statue. And of course I would go home and I would work on this film about Chief Standing Bear statue, just the irony of that, of what that meant and just seeing a person who is lauded in so many spots of this country and yet it just made the Chief Standing Bear statue feel so much more vital and important and urgent. Um, so yeah, there's a, I think 
there's so much to be said about the, the importance and what I hope people talk about after this film. Most importantly, I hope people have conversations. Yeah, I hope this is the beginning, right? Exactly. So Don, I have a question for you. Um, thank you for putting your money behind this. I'd love to know what really moved you to donate the funds, both for the statue of Standing Bear that sits on Lincoln's Centennial Mall and this piece that's in Statuary Hall. Well, I had learned to uh, appreciate statues and their, their, their emotional content they carry and the messages they carry. But of course, it's also uh, statues have to be in the right place to where people will see them and appreciate them and learn from them. But, but because I knew of that and then learned of the, the story of, the, of Standing Bear and the Ponca from Judy um, and then from uh, continuing to read the works of Joe Starita, others who've, who've documented this, um, it was it was it became obvious that that it would be good to have a significant statue of standing bear uh, placed in prominent places where it would tell that story and so that's that's in effect what we what we did and why I was so enthused about doing it you had both location and the fantastic work that Ben has done thanks and and what do you hope that people will think or do or feel after seeing these statues? Well, hope that they will, they will learn uh, more about the story, from, become curious from seeing that, and they will learn from that. It's so important to understand our history and how we got to where we are, and, um, yeah, and, and that, that, will, that will inspire people. Wonderful thing about statues is they're on 24 hours a day. They're never off. <laughs> and so they're there. And if people, uh, if people are bit with them and see them, they're three dimension. They're, they're real. They, it, it, it's, a, it's a fabulous uh, medium to convey things. So I think people, I hope that people will, in fact, move, be moved to learn more. And on, on learning that, you know, if, if, if you uh, don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. And so I think this is an important thing for everybody. Great, thanks. This is such a positive story. So this is a difficult question, so I don't know who wants to answer it, but so many statues right now are being torn down by angry crowds around the country. I'm so proud that this hasn't happened in Nebraska, and Nebraska is really different, and we're, we've been able to peacefully return two pieces home and, re and replace those pieces with women and a Native American. Why do you think that might be? I'm very proud of it. I'm not from Nebraska, but that certainly makes me really proud to live here. I think I have an interesting perspective on that question because being a sculptor and watching sculptures of different people that you either love or hate, you know, being torn down around the country or pol polarizing figures has touched a chord with me a little bit because I think what Don just touched on about um, you know, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And so you don't want to be ignorant of your history. I think a lot of our history today in statuary would serve a great cause, even if you don't celebrate the individual, if it were placed into a context where you could learn from what they did, good or bad, and then we could go forward as a society. So for instance, like I completely understand the insensitivity of having like a, a Civil War general from the Confederacy at a state capitol where everybody has to use that building for our state government. But what if you take that out of context and move it to a museum on the Civil War and you can tell about the South and slavery and you can teach the future generations why slavery was wrong and why this was an institution that needed to be put out of commission and the Civil War was a horrible war that was fought for that righteous reason of getting rid of slavery. If you could put it in context like that, then this thing that is an icon of hate can suddenly become an icon of learning. And that's a lot of what I've seen in like Holocaust museums around the world that I've visited. The, um, the motto is never forget. And so I think that when we go into a Holocaust museum, and you learn about Nazi history and you see Nazi artifacts, to me, it's very powerful. It's a very powerful deterrent for that kind of thinking in the future. So 
So that's kind of been my perspective on the whole statue tearing down thing. I think it's, it's time to rethink a lot of these and replace them and maybe use them um, for the right reasons. Anyone else? Any ideas? Or may maybe there was some pushback here in Nebraska about removing the two statues. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, I don't think there really was that much pushback. As I said, a lot of things that happened prior to this legislation. Uh, we closed down white clay and we've, you know, done other things. Uh, through the efforts of my dear friend, Senator Patty Pansingbrooks and Senator Tom Brewer, having the unicameral, I think that uh, since we did this just not that long ago uh, out in D.C., we are uh, going to be celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day next year in Nebraska, and we're going to have tribal flags in our state capitol. So this just kind of opens up the door to other opportunities. And I think that's what Standing Bear uh, has done over the last, in my career time. Uh, more and more people learn the story, they like the story, and they, they feel bad about it. And I always try to uh, encourage others to think of Standing Bear and how brave he was, so brave, and how honorable he was, and humble. So I think that's, Standing Bear wouldn't have wanted uh, someone else to be torn down so he could be there. Uh, those stories are, have value too, as Ben described. So each day I try to look to the story of Standing Bear and really let it inspire my life. And I say, you know, do better, be better, be Standing Bear strong. And I'm just so thankful that uh, for my relatives, ancestors uh, before me that brought me to where I am, I'm so thankful and grateful, and for the future generations, and everybody on the stage here has uh, been a part of this. I thought the, it's kind of like going to a wedding or a big event. You want it to go real slow. You don't want it to be over with. <laughs> when we were there in D.C., it was so awesome. I couldn't even think, though uh, those little camera people were like little mice running up, and it was just so magical. And when Speaker Pelosi mispronounced my name, I didn't even hear that because I was so like starstruck and just so amazed. And tonight to get to see the backside of the story, that was really so wonderful. And I want to thank Ingrid for being open to, or she insisted, it was her idea. And at first I resisted, but she didn't want to have a narrator. And I thought it was magical without a narrator. All of the voices that spoke, they were just like Standing Bear. They got to have their moment to reach out their hand and lead that. And I also thought that that animation, I hope all the children watching love the animation because that was something that, you know, took more effort and money, et cetera. But I think it really brought uh, some aspects to the story that we didn't have, pictures and images, and it was the thread that connected it all. Uh, so again, I just marvel at all the people here, Don, uh, your generosity. I cannot thank you enough. Uh, I remember it was Thanksgiving, I believe five years ago when you emailed me, and I was so like, wow, what a gift, Don. Thank, thank you so much. What you've done for our state and our country, you've changed the landscape of America. So, uh, Well, can Judy, I, can, I, can I ask you a question? Because the question to you was, has there been pushback? And I was absolutely astonished that the uh, legislature didn't vote unanimously, apparently, to put Standing Bear in, in Washington, but with only one abstention. But that's incredible. Just one vote, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's just incredible. But has there, has there been any pushback at all that you've seen or heard of within the state for these changes? Oh, no, I don't think so at isn't that, all. Isn't that marvelous? That it's, is fantastic. Uh, people are just really so proud of the story. And every time there's a ceremony out in the Statuary Hall, whether that was Elijah Cummings lying in state, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you saw Standing Bear right there behind. And wow, 
that I was so proud of. It was so beautiful. And the way Ben was able to capture the gold in the curtains. And each of the three standing bears is unique to their setting. The one along the Niobrara, the one on the Centennial Mall, and then that out there. So uh, he is just really... Sandy Bear is a rock star. <laughs> he rocks my world. <laughs> and so, no, Don, I think that people are learning uh, through the leadership of our current leaders. And I want to say for all of our tribes, as Larry said in his opening land acknowledgement, this was the beginning to help all Indian people. And so this is for the celebration of all our 574 federally recognized tribes and state tribes as the first people. Uh, they are also liking this, and other things will come as a result of that. We're going to have more sculptures in Nebraska for Indian people. I can tell you that, and I'm committed to making sure that other tribes are represented as well. And Chairman Wright, you might want to add to that. Through your leadership, Chairman Wright has been just amazing to work with. And I've known him way back to when he was in college. <laughs> and he was, he's done a really outstanding job. Uh, and as you heard, he, he's a national leader. And another thing that was so fun to work with my daughter, who uh, was the pro bono attorney on that, that she got to be involved with this project. And for all of us, I think we have special reasons why it's meaningful to us. So how can we move from this incredible recognition of Chief Standing Bear and keep making progress in our state? What are some things that we should think about or move on? I, I, I think we have a time limit, don't we? <laughs> we may not be able to get, may, may not be able to get all that in. <laughs> But, but, I, but I, you know, as we talk about the statue itself, it, it, uh, it's one thing to look at pictures, and, but when you look at this statue, it, the, it really humanizes uh, Standing Bear in, in, in those settings, all three statues. Uh, obviously, the one in Statuary Hall is, is the biggest and, and brightest, and, and you can look at that all day long. And, and not get tired of that. But for not only Ponca people, but I, th but I think indigenous people, when you look at that statue in, in that setting compared to every other statue in there, even, even the other native statues, it, th there's no comparison. And then when you put that story behind there and, and here's a snapshot in history of what, what this happened at that time frame, and at the end of the treaty era, era and the reservation era and and all of those things that were part of this and and here's as he's standing there in that in that position saying the same god made us both and and not being considered a person in this country not not being considered a human being I, I think that's that's something whether you're native or not native you can relate to and in almost every uh, background in this country has a story whether it's Irish or Italian German Jewish whatever there's some story of being less than or being considered less than human and, and, and or slaves for that matter and in this snapshot in time, you look at that today as you stand there, there's part of you that can relate to that story. If, if you understand what the commitment that Standing Bear made to his dying son, every parent can relate to that. It doesn't matter who you are, what color you are, what your background, faith, anything, they can relate. And as we sit here in Nebraska and, and um, what that means to Nebraskans as it, from this state. They come back to this state. They, can, they may not live here, but this is their home. And how many Nebraskans that leave are willing to do what this person and those that followed him, my ancestors, were willing to die to come back home? 
to come back to this where we call Nebraska today. And I can't think of a better person that would represent this state even, you know, before those geopolitical borders existed, this was our land. This is where our people lived and died. And this is where Nebraskans since then, since this became a state, have done. We, you know, there's multi-generational farmers that have farmed this land that people have died and their ancestors, their, their relatives are buried here. And so I think when, when you take out the color of skin of Standing Bear, think about that kind of story, I think anybody can put themselves into that. And, and I hope that's what's taken from this, from others that may not be Native. And then when they think of what Native people have gone through that have lost their land, have been relocated, and just to try and get a foothold back, I just, I just want to bury my son. And and I want to be back where I grew up, where my relatives are buried, where, where that's all I know. And to our people at that time, our medicine was in those hills in Niobrara. Our way of life, how we lived, uh, our, our food sources, everything we knew to take care of our people were there. They weren't down in Oklahoma. And I think as people have, uh, even today, uh, people have learned to to adapt and they know uh, what's in those areas and there's a connection to that land for people here today that aren't native but I think hearing this story they can appreciate that and um, you know as, as we move forward uh, I think those that's the power that this statue can have uh, for uh, for all all tribal nations because they can all relate to this in, in some way most many tribes have their own trail of tears many tribes have their own leaders that have done extraordinary things to keep their people uh, safe and protect them and and you know find a way forward and and so all, all tribal nations have this story and it's just been an honor and and <clears throat> to be uh, on the fringe of this and watch all the amazing things that Judy's done over the years uh, to help further this and and Joe and, and Ben and, and Don's generosity to help bring this to life and all of those that support it. And and I think, again, if, if you take out the color of that person's skin, uh, it's a story people can, it resonates with, with everybody. It absolutely is a universal story. I have one more question for Judy, but maybe one of you has a question that you want to ask. I don't know the next time your group will get together. And I know we want to drag this out for as long as possible because this is a dream come true for Judy. So I don't know if anyone has any questions for each other. No? I have a question. I'd just, you know, I'd like you to speak a little bit more, maybe you, Judy, or you, Larry about um, the fact that when I watch it, I see that it is of meaning to all the tribes. I know that they are different nations and different peoples, but to me, when you see Standing Bear in there, it's a win for all Native peoples, and I just love to hear that. I can't hear enough of it. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, through the work that I do and representing my tribe and, you know, the honor that I have to do that, and you hear... Uh, other other uh, other stories from other tribal nations and 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 I think you know I know how I am when I hear those other stories so I, I I hear their leader I hear that and it makes me think of okay in my tribe who is that and 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 I know through my travels since this has happened I, I can't tell you how many other tribal leaders have reached out and and just said what an amazing story and and how how did you do that and i had to say i had nothing to do with it <laughs> and uh, you know a lot more amazing people you know we were just fortunate that uh it, it was standing bear who who was ponca and and so you know just that alone uh people see that and go okay how do we do that you know can this be done and and they they ask about the process and 
you know, you're at the you're at the mercy of that state legislature and, and hope that uh, just like ours was in this particular issue, that they were open minded enough to see the value of this and the opportunity and all but one. We won't call the one out, but there was one. <laughs> and, uh, you know, can that happen in another state? And, and the you know, that possibility exists. And I think that does give people uh, hope. Um, or in just to see something, you know, again, and just the way people uh, have seen it and just admired and, and say, you know, how, how did that get done? And I, you know, I, I just, I kind of joke and say I was part of it and I helped, but no, I had nothing to do with that. And um, it, it's just amazing to hear those kind of stories and, uh, and, and people really do uh, make, it, it becomes personal. Uh, because I mean everything's personal. We 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 personalize those kind of events, and and this was I think this is definitely one of those things that people can see from another tribal nation and think, hey, we have our own standing bear, whoever that might be, and and how do we tell that story? Judy, now that you can check this off, done. <laughs> What's next for the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs? Oh boy, uh, I have a lot of legislation that I'm working on. Uh, women in Nebraska, Native women, we have been not treated as well as other women in America and we've been missing and murdered at a higher rate than anyone. And so thinking of Standing Bear, um, I think because of this story, it's given support that we were able to have a bill LB 154. This year we're going to work on creating a task force so that it will be statutory and have membership that can really be stakeholders from the courts to um, the grassroots people. That's one thing and as I just said, um, Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, we have tribal uh, license plates that help fund scholarships for our children. We're going to have other bills, and then there's some other projects that I'm working that are still a confidential, but uh, Nebraska will be celebrating other Native stories in the future. So uh, I want to thank my staff at the Indian Commission, especially Scott Schaefer, who worked with me through all of this, and he was on the credits there, couldn't be here tonight. but. Uh, there's so much more work to do, and we're really thankful that we have a good uh, board of directors of Indian people and that we have, uh, through these stories, we've uh, gained a lot of support for what our agency does. But I would ask all people in our state that watch this and are listening to uh, keep your minds open. And if you embrace Standing Bear, uh, respect the tribe's sovereignty. Don't, don't just let it be on one day that you think this is a good story, but then you don't act. Uh, whenever you can vote to support things that the tribes are doing, I think that's a really way to have a living legacy to Standing Bear, to say Indian people aren't just in statue, they are here today. The Ponca tribe was restored 30 years ago on Halloween. And we're, all of these tribes that live here, we're not invisible, we are real people. And we need your help to get things like this to happen. So I want to challenge all of my friends and Nebraskans and Americans to don't forget the First Peoples, especially our Native women and children who really uh, have suffered. And during this COVID time, Native people have suffered a lot more than others because of this history that has proceeded and brought us to where we are someplace in isolated places where we don't have water accessible like my Navajo relatives, the Diné people throughout America. I think you've all heard about those stories. So I'm praying for all of those and praying that all of us stay well and we can stay strong and do good and be honorable like Standing Bear. And it's not easy, but when you give your word, keep your word. Weeblaho. Just, just real quick, and I'm sorry. And this kind of dovetails on, on Ben's question. When when you see a statue like this and you hear the story that this video, this this documentary showed, and you know, and I'll, I'll admit I cried too. So throw that in there. <laughs> so you don't, you're not alone. 
But when, when you hear what the story is and, 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 and you see this statue, and, and, I, and again, I, I think it humanizes uh, this experience. And it doesn't relegate Native people to caricatures and stereotypes that still per persist today with mascots. And I think this, just this statue, if, if, if you see that and truly come at it in, in that context, there's no way that you can walk away and say, mascots, the way that they portray Native people are honoring us. This is honoring us. Something like this that tells our story and the way that this is presented, that's a, that's a form of honoring our people. Mascots don't do that in any form or fashion. And I think this can go a long way, and this story can go a long way to bridging that gap and really bringing that clarity that's needed on those mascot issues across this country. Thank you so much. And thank you all on behalf of the Nebraska Commission on Native Americans and the University of Nebraska. Thank you for your hard work and all your support. And thanks to everyone listening. Good night.